Good morning, church family. How are you today? So good to see you. Welcome to Clear Creek Church of Christ. My name is Josh, one of the ministers here. If this is your first time, welcome. If you're a longtime family member, it is so good to see you. And for all those joining us at home or online, welcome. We love you and we're glad that you're joining us today on part six and our final part in this series called Asking for a Friend. If you have your Bible, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and grab it and turn to two passages. The first one is Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Then put your finger there and then turn with me to Matthew 28. Matthew 3 and Matthew 28. Now, we're finishing up this series called Asking for a Friend. Next week, we're going to dive into a series called Love One Another. And it's going to be looking at 1 John and the beauty of what it means to be part of a body and how that it forms us and informs us as people. But today, as we wrap this up, we've been answering a lot of just questions, questions we have, questions our friends have. And I love to be a part of a church that not only wants to answer questions, but feels safe enough to answer questions. It's a rare thing to be part of a church whose elders say yes. doesn't matter what the question is. Let's address it because the people deserve answers. And so I applaud our elders and so thankful that we've been able to do this. But today, we're going to jump in with our last question. And here's why asking questions is so important. Isn't it true that questions often reveal what we believe, and questions often reveal what we think we believe, and help us understand what we really should believe? Isn't it true that questions clarify so many things for us? In fact, questions sometimes will help us understand. We thought one thing was true, and we come to find maybe something else is true. So let's just do a real silly example. I'm going to invite you to impress the people around you with your deep baseball knowledge with this question. Share with someone, if you know the answer, why or where did it begin that we started doing this wild thing called the seventh inning stretch? Where did that begin? You've got 20 seconds. Share with someone if you have a guess. Ready, go. Okay. Anyone have a guess? Raise your hand if you think you know why or where it began that we do the seventh inning stretch. Anyone in here? Got, got a hand or two? Yeah, yeah. Anyone want to call out an answer? No one wants to take the risk. Well, let me tell you, most of us would say, well, you know, of course it began in about 1910, because of course we all know these facts. 1910, President Taft stood up during the seventh inning. That's a pretty impressive feat. He was a big old boy, about 300 pounds, and all 300 pounds gets up, and all the people look around, they see that the president stood up, so they go, well, let's stand up with him. And so isn't that where the seventh inning stretch began? And the answer is, actually, no, it's not. Some of you go, I know, Josh, it's not from there. Rather, it started in 1882. We all know this, of course, right? It began in 1882 when this this individual by the name of Brother Jasper at Manhattan College, was at a baseball game with a bunch of young students. And around the seventh inning, he had them all stand up, stretch their legs so they wouldn't be so fidgety. And we say, well, is, is that where it began? And the answer is, well, actually, no. We, we have evidence that the seventh inning stretch began before then. You go all the way back to 1869. 1869, we've discovered a letter from then that took place talking about an event that happened, get this now, at the Cincinnati Red Stockings, not socks, but stockings game, yes, they were the stockings, in which people around the seventh inning started to get up, mill around, move around, and that became a tradition. Why am I telling you this? What's my point? And yes, there's a point. The point is this, sometimes what we believe and why we believe it, we have no idea. We do certain things, but we don't know why we do them. Or we think something's important, but we don't even know why it's important. And I'm afraid that is true in the Lord's church, especially when it comes to this question, what about, next slide, baptism. What about baptism? We have all sorts of assumptions why we do this, where it comes from. And today all I want to do is I want to show you why we do it. And more than that, I want to show you how baptism, as important as it is, is actually just a part of something bigger, 
something more impressive and expansive. And why we do it doesn't begin with Peter on the day of Pentecost. It doesn't begin with examples through the early church. The reason we baptize actually goes all the way back to one person who is not just a person. His name was Jesus, and he is God. And so I want to show you two things, why we do it, then I'm going to show you how it's a part of something much bigger. If you're taking notes, here's the first point, why we baptize. Number one, because Jesus commanded it. Jesus commanded it. In Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, gives us Jesus' final marching orders. Let me give you the setting before we put the passage up. Jesus has done his three years of ministry. He has died on a cross, been in the tomb for three days. He rose from the grave, then appeared to his followers over a course of 40 days. And now at the end of the end, he gathers them on a mountain. And he says, I'm giving you final marching orders. And this is what Jesus says to his followers. Verse 19, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority, verse 18, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations, not just of some people, but all, all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey, what's this word, church? Let's try that again. What's this word, church? Everything, not just some things, not just the things I already want to do, not just the things I currently do, but teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And then he says these words. I love these words. Do we have the next slide? We do not have the next slide. And then Jesus came. Oh, oops, go back, go back. We'll stop there. Okay. So Jesus starts with this idea. He commands it. And if there was no other reason to do it, then Jesus said to do it. That's a pretty good reason. Amen? So he starts right there. Jesus commanded it. And I think this is such a powerful thing that Jesus says do it, and so followers do it. We don't just talk about it. We don't just think about it, but we do it. I was thinking about it earlier this week. In my house, as the father and Lindsay as the mother, we have all authority in our homes. Parents, aren't you glad that you have all authority? And you're, you're like, tell that to my crying eight-month-old. It just, there's no, be quiet, they keep crying. Okay, in theory, you have all authority, right? We have two kids, Stephen, who's 11, Emma, who's eight. And I was thinking about it earlier this week. I go to my kids and be like, hey, I want you to pick up your toys, put them away in your room. How wild would it be if my kids said, well, Dad, you know, I think I need to pray about it just a little bit first to see if God wants me to put my toys away. Or what if I said to them, I want you to go to bed. It is bedtime. How weird would it be for our kids to look back at us and say, well, I'll tell you what, let me get with a small group of my friends from church, and we're going to have a Bible study and look at the Greek for go to bed or bedtime and see what the Greek word says about that. Isn't it incredible that there are certain things we would be absolutely appalled with from our children that the church does to Jesus? But if he says do it, that becomes our marching orders if we are followers of Jesus Christ. And here's what you need to know. Throughout the Bible, over and over and over again, throughout the New Testament, everyone who comes to saving faith in Jesus, who trusts him as Lord, you will see them repent, be baptized, and then they receive this gift of the Spirit. There's only one exception to that. That's the man on the cross. We can talk about that at some point. But you need to know over and over and over again. And so you come to Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches the first sermon of the church, and a multitude of people are there. They hear this. They're convicted of sin. They ask what they must do. They're told, repent, be baptized, and they will receive the gift of God's Spirit, His very presence in them. And what do they do? Do they say, let's have a Bible study about it? Do they say, let's pray about it? Do they say, well, I need to really think on this? They just do it. And then Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 8, you have a man who's riding along in his chariot, he's reading the scriptures, and because he's reading, he doesn't understand, so a follower of Jesus approaches this man, interprets it, explains to him what he's reading, and the one riding in the chariot is so convicted, as he's riding, he sees water, and he goes, oh, I need baptism. That'd be like you and me driving home today from church, and maybe you're going down Highway 153, and you're going along, and all of a sudden, you're like... I need to be baptized. So you pull over and you get baptized in a mud puddle. That's what we're seeing here in Acts 8. They're baptized, or Acts 16, where there's a man. He's a Philippian jailer. And this jailer, through the middle of the night, has an encounter with the living God. 
He recognizes his sin, but also the forgiving power of God. And so he comes to trust Jesus as his Lord. He gathers his family. They trust Jesus as Lord. And they are immediately baptized. Because our Savior said, go make disciples, baptizing them. Number one, Jesus commanded it. Number two, the reason we're baptized is because Jesus modeled it. Jesus modeled it. I love what happens in Matthew chapter 3, the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He's about 30 years old, and he's beginning his public ministry. But before he starts the ministry, before he teaches, before he heals, before he does anything else, the very first thing he does is he is baptized. And so in Matthew chapter 3, I want you to hear the moment that changed everything that we follow now. It says, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan, that's Jordan River, to be baptized by John. John, his nickname was John the Baptizer or John the Baptist. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? In other words, he's like, you're God in a bod. How do I baptize you? You should baptize me. But notice what Jesus says. Let it be so now. Why? It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Jesus commands it and then Jesus models it. He says, I walked into the water and something happens in this moment and I'm inviting you to do what I do This is why we do it, but you need to understand it's a part of something much bigger. And it's all within this one passage we read. It's something much bigger. See, sometimes people will say, I need to be baptized. Here's a really great question when someone says, I need to be baptized. Here's the question. Are you ready? Why? Why? And then sometimes they'll say, well, well, the reason I need to be baptized is because I want to be a Christian. And that's a great thing, church. Is that a great thing? Yeah, it's a great thing, but here's another great question to ask if someone says, I want to be a Christian, to say, what do you mean by Christian? Isn't it true in our world and in the American church, people will call themselves Christians without following Christ? So you'll have people who, because they grew up going to a church building, they will call themselves Christian. I know a guy who calls himself a Christian, and he does not believe there is a God. How does that work? Or some will say, I'm a Christian because my parents went to church. Or I'm a Christian because I raised my hand or I said a prayer or I shaked a preacher's hand. I'm a Christian because of these. So a question that I always want to ask is, what do you mean by being a Christian? Here's a great example of this. How many of you maybe have seen a movie about the Italian mafia and there's a hitman? He goes out and he whacks someone. And then after doing that, he goes to the church. He goes into a little booth and he does what? He confesses. He is a mafia hitman Christian. How does that work exactly? See, following Jesus, it's more than what you call yourself. It's more than simply a word. Here's the big idea. Baptism is a part of this much bigger idea, which is simply this, being a Jesus follower. Next slide. Jesus follower. So what does it mean to be a Jesus follower? I want us just to look at Jesus' example So you understand how baptism is this most beautiful thing, but it's part of something much bigger. Because I don't want anyone in here to elevate it to a status it doesn't deserve, nor put it down to a level that it does not deserve either. But that we, like Christ, would understand it rightly and enjoy it fully. And so there are three things when it comes to following Christ, meaning being a Jesus follower, three things that we see from this text. I'm just going to tell them to you real fast and we'll walk through them. Number one, it means we repent. Number two, it means that we are baptized. Number three, it means that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Repent, baptized, full of the Spirit. What does it mean to repent? Well, the word repent literally means to turn around. That's all it means. So when someone says, I am repenting, it means that I was once going this way, I was walking this way, but I have stopped, and I have heard the call of Christ, and I am going to go His way, whereas I was once going my way. The basis of following Jesus is to say, thy will be done, not my will be done. I'm going to turn around. It's a 180 degree. But here again, what concerns me about the American church is many people think that we can walk, we can do our thing. Jesus comes along and says, follow me. And we say to Jesus, no, you follow me. 
And then we have this view that now I've got Jesus in my life, I'll continue doing what I've been doing, going where I'm going, so that when I get to the end of my life facing hell, Jesus will step in front, save me from hell. And we think that's okay, but friends, repentance is not continuing down the path you've been going. It is turning around and following Jesus. Now question, why or how do we see that in this text? After all, did Jesus, uh, by the way, answer is no. Did Jesus ever do anything sinful, church? So why does he need, or why do we even use this idea of repentance? Here's where this idea comes from. Just stay with me for a moment. Luke chapter 3 and verse 3 tells us that John the Baptist was baptizing people, and the baptism was a baptism of of forgiveness of sins. It was for repentance, turning away. But here's what you need to see that's so interesting. Jesus, put that slide back up, would you? Notice, no, go back one more. The one with the passage, the verse. Yeah, there we go. Jesus says, let's do this to fulfill all righteousness. To fulfill all righteousness. You say, what does that have to do with anything? Here's what it has to do with everything. Repentance does not simply mean to stop doing bad things. It means stop doing things that may not be the best things or the right things. See, repentance or following Jesus is not simply avoiding bad things. It is doing the right things that God has called us to. Let me give you an example. Peter, excuse me, Paul, in Philippians chapter 3, he talks about following Jesus. And he says, all the things that I once ran after, all the things I once saw as ultimate, my degrees, my status, the fact that I was such a good guy, my moral behavior, all these things, I now count them as rubbish, garbage. The Greek word there is skubalon. Everyone say skubalon. That word means more than just garbage, by the way. And so when we hear Paul say this, we hear him say, oh, I got rid of these things, and we go, yay, Paul, you quit doing bad things. Eh." These were things that many of us would be envious of. He's saying the things that he threw away were not just sins, but it's his status. It's his prestige. It's his degrees. It's the things that so many of us are chasing with everything we have. In other words, repentance is not simply stop doing what is sinful. Repentance is don't let anything else compete with following Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus to the rich young ruler says, sell everything you've got because for that man, riches are not a sin, but for that man, they were taking him somewhere other than for Jesus. Repentance is turning around. One of the best examples I have of repentance happened to me 19 years ago. 19 years ago. 19 years ago, I was seeing this very sweet young lady. She was nice. She was fine. Things were good. Life was okay. We were going this way. Life is okay. Until one night, I go to a worship night for a bunch of college students. I get there. The girl I'm seeing is not there. I sit down, and as I'm sitting there, lo and behold, this other person comes and walks in. She looks like an angel, and she sings like an angel, and her name is Lindsay. And as we began to sing, she begins to sing this song. Don't you wish your girlfriend was hot like... She wasn't really singing that, but that's what I'm hearing, okay? You shouldn't know that song, by the way. Don't, okay, okay. So what happens? Do I say, hey, Lindsay, I've got this great relationship. Why don't you join us? I'm going to keep going this way. Why don't you just come with us? What self-respecting woman, what self-respecting savior would say, oh, you just keep going. I'm just going to tag along. Life was good. Things were okay. This girl was fine. There was nothing wrong, but I found someone so much better, who is so much more beautiful, who had a heart that was so gracious that it's like everything else, even good things, I am abandoning for the best thing. Now take that illustration, ramp it up by a thousand times, and that is the biblical picture of repentance where you say even the great things of life become strangely dim. In the light of your glory and grace, I'm chasing after Jesus. Nothing else compares. I'm running after you. This is what it means to be a Christ follower. Everything else is abandoned. So we repent, and then second, we are baptized. Jesus was baptized. He commanded it. He modeled it. But let's talk about what this word means. This word comes from this weird little Greek word called baptizo. Everyone say baptizo. 
You say, what does that mean? Well, it just means baptized. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, it means baptizo. You say, wait, is this circular? Yeah, here's what happened. It's a little Greek word in the text that was never translated into what we would use. And so the word literally means immerse, put into, bury, cover, dunk. That's what the word baptizo means. In fact, do you know the very first time outside of Scripture that we find this word baptizo? We find it 200 years before Jesus. There's a physician who has a recipe, get this, for making pickles. He says you take the cucumber and you baptizo the cucumber into the vinegar. Now, is the pickle saved? No, it's about to be eaten. There's no salvation for that pickle. That's the first time, though, that we see this word outside of Scripture. And there are many different times where this word is used that gives us the flair of what it means. For instance, it's not just pickles. It's also like if you hear about a ship that has been sunk off the coast, they'd say it's been baptizoed. Or if you take cloth and you put it in a vat to dye it, to change its colors, you've baptizoed it, you've buried it, you have immersed it, you have covered it over, put it into. Or what about this one? It's also been used to talk about people who drown. Okay, now, if some of you are a little bit nervous or freaked out about this whole water by immersion thing, let's just kind of cut that one off. And it, Baptism, it's about pickles. Just think pickles, okay? But what am I trying to tell you here? is that this is the way Christ was baptized. He was covered. He was immersed. He was fully under. And for those of us who, does this language sound familiar? Who are in Christ Jesus. It's like, oh, you cover all of me. I'm in you completely. You just bury me. You make me all of you. I want to be covered by you. This is why Paul the Apostle in Romans 5 talks about You and I being buried with Christ in baptism, and then we are raised to life with Christ through the resurrection that he has, and he now gives us as we meet him in this moment. Now, one of the things that always comes up when it comes to baptism is we want to ask questions about, well, hey, when am I actually saved? Like, when does it happen? What is the moment? And so, have you noticed the church has a million different answers for this question? And there's a lot of arguments even. A lot of good Christians fight about this. So is it, well, am I baptized when I confess Jesus? Am I, am I saved, rather, when I repent? Am I saved when I receive the Holy Spirit? Am I saved when I'm baptized? When am I saved? Or when it's baptism, uh, is it when I'm standing in the water? When I go under the water? When I come out of the water? When am I saved? Have you noticed we have all these questions? So, so let me give you my basic answer, and then let me give you the biblical answer. My basic answer is simply this. If you and I commit to obey Jesus' commands and model our lives after Jesus, all these other questions won't even matter. Just get baptized, follow him into the water. But let me give you, let me give you the biblical answer as well. Because sometimes people say, well, does baptism save us or what is it for? So go with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. And I want to try to show this to you as simply as I can biblically. What does Scripture teach about this beautiful act? So 1 Peter chapter 3, this is in the middle of a longer sentence. I'll try to explain it as we go. But 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 20, says this. To those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, pay attention to that word, while the ark was being built. In it, the ark, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Notice this, though. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, does baptism save you? I want you to pay attention to the two things that Peter says here. First, he does say baptism now saves you. He says that. Immediately afterwards, he then also clarifies, what does that mean? Does that mean that if you just get in the water, you're saved? So if you go swimming this summer, are you saved? If you go to the beach, or if someone trips you into a puddle, are you saved? I didn't want to be saved. Too bad. Is that how this works? Is there something? And here's what I want you to see. The water, he says, yes, baptism saves you. This water, something's going on here, but there is nothing magical about the water. I've told you this before. I know where the water in that baptistry comes from, and it ain't holy. 
That water doesn't save you. Otherwise, if you got a bath today or if you went swimming today, you'd be saved, correct? Rather, notice what he says, the clarifier immediate athlete. After he says, it is not the removal of dirt. It's not like the water scrubs the sins from your soul, but from the body, but it is the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It's in this moment you are recognizing your need for God, your inability to save yourself, that you are a sinner, and that you are saying, I can't keep going this way because it is leading to death. I follow you, and I am pledging, I am promising that my life is now his. Whatever he says, whatever he wants, whatever he desires, I'm his. And the first thing, you're baptized. In this moment, this act is a pledge saying, I trust you, and I will follow you every day. And so when you go into the water, I'm coming in with you. I'm going to follow you in every way. And this beautiful thing happens. Something changes. Peter says, you receive this forgiveness that life is different. The things that you once held on to and that held on to you now have been ripped from you. You've been washed clean. And Jesus now is not simply your friend, but he is your Savior and he is your Lord. And so then this third thing happens, and Jesus shows it to us. Repent, be baptized, and then be filled with the Holy Spirit, the promised gift of God. I love in this moment where Jesus is meeting and showing us what it looks like to follow well. He goes into the water, and when he comes out of the water, we're told a few things happen. One of those things is that the Spirit of God comes on Jesus in the form of a dove. Now, where have we heard of a dove? Well, Noah's Ark. By the way, one more little detail. Do you notice that Peter uses an illustration to describe what's happening in this moment? In 1 Peter chapter 3, he then uses this detail about Noah and the ark. He says that when God's wrath was coming, when flood waters were coming, God gave the people a way out. Noah, build an ark. Noah and his family climb into the ark, and in the ark they find salvation. They are saved. And Peter is now saying the water has no power, but when you follow Jesus into it, you are actually climbing into Jesus Christ, who now covers you everywhere, who saves you everywhere. He is the one who has redeemed, restored, and prevents you from God's wrath and calls you and creates in you a new being you become a co-heir with him, a child of God. And so then the seal, the promise, is you get the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit comes as a dove. Another little detail in, in, in Noah's story. The water is still on the earth. Noah sends out a dove, correct? He sends this dove out to look for where there is land because the water is covered with, uh, the land is covered with water and he's going, where is their hope? Where is their life? Will we forever be adrift? And if I were to ask you this morning, do you feel like your life is adrift? Do you feel like there is no place you can stand without sinking right now? I want you to hear this very carefully. God is beautiful in many ways, and one of those is he gives us pictures to hold on to. For when Noah sends out the dove, the dove will come back with an olive branch, the symbol that there is life on the other side of God's wrath, that as we have been saved in Jesus, we're not just saved from death, but we're saved to life. And the Spirit of God comes on us as a seal, a promise, saying, you are now not who you were. There is now new life. But one of the questions I get asked all the time is, Josh, why don't we talk more about the Holy Spirit in the church? And here's why I think we don't talk about the Spirit of God so much. It's because we don't talk about repentance in the church. Consider this with me. If all you need from God is not to go to hell but you don't want to live like Jesus while you are alive, then you don't need the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the enabling power of God to help you do what is not natural to you. The Holy Spirit is the empowering presence of God. When you are tempted to run back to your old ways, He woos you to God. He says, this is the way. Jesus tells us the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. The Holy Spirit will guide you in all ways. The Holy Spirit is God's, not just seal, but God's empowering presence. If you have no desire to be like Jesus, you don't need the Holy Spirit. But if your heart is to follow Jesus 
then you and I, we need God's help. Does anyone agree with that idea this morning? And so he says, in this moment, repent, be baptized. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Some years ago, a video was making its rounds on the internet. It was in the middle of a church service, and there was a young boy who was about to be baptized. And you have the preacher in the water waiting for him, and the guy, I mean, he looks like the preacher. Stereotypically, he's standing there, has a very somber look on his face, ready for this moment. And you see this kid just barely in frame on the top step of the baptistry. And instead of walking in, what does this boy do? He jumps and drops the world's biggest cannonball. <laughs> the preacher's doused, water comes out, it's like Shamu, the splash zone of SeaWorld. Now, I'm not endorsing that. Please don't do that, okay? Just, just so we're clear here. But what a beautiful picture. What a beautiful heart that says, I'm not just in with Jesus a little bit. I'm not just going to come up to the edge of the water and see if the water is fine. But this is the vision, this is the picture that following Jesus means that you say, I am all in. I am turning away from what held on to me. I'm going after Jesus. I am all in with Christ and I receive his presence. I will partner with him so that I will become who he has called me to be. And so three questions. Are you repenting today, friend? If you are in Christ, repentance is a daily decision. Because isn't it true, the call of the world and flesh is just so strong. We constantly need to be saying, no, and I will follow. I will turn around. Are you repenting? Number two, have you been baptized? Have you said, I am all in with Jesus. I step into him. He will cover me. I am in my Lord. And have you received the Spirit of God? And maybe more importantly, are you partnering with the Spirit when He speaks to you in that moment where you go, don't do this, don't do this? Are you listening and obeying or are you telling Him, be quiet? These three things are what it means to be a Christ follower. So when someone says, I want to be baptized, you say, amen, what does that mean? I want to be a Christian. You say, amen. What do you mean by that? Do you want to follow Jesus? We can talk about that. So where are you this morning? If you are not a repentant person, I would invite you today, just turn around. You don't have to walk 100 steps to get back to God. He is as close as this very breath on your lips. He will forgive you for any sin. Have you been baptized? If not, the water is great, and yeah, we'll even let you cannonball. We want you to know Jesus. And are you partnering with the Spirit? Listening and saying yes when he speaks. This is what it means to follow Jesus, and you can do it today. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the one who calls us, draws us, gives us life. I want to be the kind of man who listens to what you say, and just because you say it, I say, yes, sir. I want to be so enthralled by my hero, Jesus, that whatever he does, I just say, I want to be like him. I just want to do what he does. I want to go where he goes, say what he says, that my thoughts would be his thoughts, that I would listen and just do. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters and for my friends in this room and online. I pray that we would be quick to turn and for anyone in here who has not repented of their sin, maybe they were dunked, but they don't repent. Lord, I beg you to convict them so they will turn from death and find life in Jesus. We pray for those who have yet to say yes to you by following you into the waters of baptism. And for all of us who have received you, may we partner with your presence, your spirit, that we would be like you in all things. So that when this life is over and we hear your voice, We'll simply take the next step into eternity with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all those who agreed said, amen. amen.